Heavenly Father and Lord of all creation, you who have been patient and waiting and loving, pouring out your affection and your discipline on the children of your family, you who have married the very people who have trouble connecting with you. Father, will you be here this morning? Father, will you fill our hearts? We bring before you all of our hindrances, all of the things that keep us from your presence, that keep us from your love. We bring those to you this morning. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ that they would be removed from us. We ask that we would be able to respond to your invitation to enter your presence. Father, I pray for the reading and the preaching of your word this morning. Would you anoint my mouth with your Holy Spirit? Would you soften the hearts of those who hear? Father, that we may be doers of the word as well as hearers. In your name we pray. Amen. Kids may go ahead. May go ahead. We are going to be in Genesis chapter 8. And just before we get there, I want to go over a couple of key ideas that we have uh, been going over together. Kelly, would you hit that side light over there so it brightens up? Woo! Time to wake up. Before I do that, to our Sandlot Choir, our worshipers, thank you so much. <coughs> that blessed me. We've been talking about understanding um, both sin and salvation through family, through personal relationships with one another. We've been going through Genesis, and one of the themes that we've been able to take out of every single story is that sin is not simply a transgression between a person and God. It's not just doing something bad, uh, breaking the law, for which we sort of owe God, right? But we see that sin is uh, this infectious disease, this creature that is crouching at the door, that has a lust for us, has a desire for us, and wants to sort of reach out and get us. And we see that when we participate in sin, it destroys the relationships around us, as well as our relationship with God. And last night, or last week, rather, felt like last night, but it was indeed a week ago, I was preaching on the flood, and we looked at the righteousness of one man, and how it seems that salvation is sort of the same nature as sin. That salvation desires us. That it's more than just sort of wiping out the scorecard of bad things that you've done against God. But that salvation is a restoration of a relationship with God. That it has less to do with not being bad anymore. And it has more to do with being in God's presence. Why was Noah righteous? Not because he had no sin, but because he walked with God. Because he listened to God and he obeyed God. The book of Hebrews will tell us that's faith. It was Noah's faith that made him righteous. It was his ability to listen to God and to follow up, to obey. And we see that the salvation that was extended to Noah was actually sort of, sort of, if you could imagine this bright beam of light shining down from heaven and hitting one dude, and then it's sort of refracting off of him, and the people standing right around him are in the light too. The Bible sort of specific, does not specifically say, oh, and, and Noah's wife was righteous, and his sons were righteous, 
and their wives were righteous. But actually we get maybe a little bit of a different picture. That they weren't very righteous or that we don't really know. That it doesn't really matter to the story. Their righteousness doesn't matter to the story. Their story of salvation. They get to get on the ark simply because Noah was being faithful. And I proposed a picture, which I, I would like to do again this morning. This is what I call the, the love story crisis. And we have seen this over and over and over again from the very first story, the garden story, on and on and on. We see that there is God and that our heart's affections are designed to be put towards God. That that is what perfection is. That, that is what sort of salvation, utopia, you know, all of the things that we think about heaven, well, when it's all made right, our heart's affections are sort of uh, unrestrained in their connection with God. But we saw in the garden story, and there's other character called the snake. And the snake represents sin. In fact, it sort of is sin. And you see, he's down there. And he's calling attention in this picture. He's saying, hey there. And our heart's affections that are pointed towards God, he's trying to call them towards him, away from God. Now, he does that by introducing something else, which I have labeled here as doubt, okay? Sin, Satan, what he's going to try to do is take that wedge, he's going to try to do this. He's going to try to insert it between our heart's affections, and it's going to serve as sort of like a ramp so that our heart's affections turn away from God, right? We call this sin, right? The, and, and this wedge right here can be anything. That wedge can be tragedy. It can be, and like, it can be totally unrelated to, to uh, uh, like, wrongdoing. It, it can just be, like, I have a hard life. And the devil's going to take that wedge, and he's going to stick your hard life between you and God, and he's, he's going to try to get it to push you away from God. And we saw that in the garden story where... The snake says to Eve, don't worry about take That fruit is actually good for you. Because God knows that in the day that you eat of it, you'll be made like God. And Eve is tempted to be like God. Which is crazy because from the very beginning, we have been told in every single story, God created man in the image and the likeness of God. That he, he actually created us like him. So what was this temptation that the devil is putting on to Eve? This temptation to know the difference between good and evil. And it turns out that humans aren't really supposed to know that. They're not supposed to be able to operate in the world of light and dark. They're just supposed to be creatures of light. We're not built to handle sin. We're not built to struggle with sin. We're really horrible at it. And so God has to do something here because humans are victim of the devil taking this wedge. And it can also be doubt. It can be somebody else doing something to you. It can also be your own misdeeds that's, that seem to ramp you away from God. So God does this. He uses the very same doubt, the very same tragedy, the very same sin that the devil's holding and pushing towards you. And actually, if we have this moment of faith we can get on the inside of that wedge, and that wedge serves God's purpose and not the devil's, and it pushes us closer to him. That indeed, we can go through really horrible things. People can do horrible things to us. We can have these tremendous doubts about who God is and, 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 and what he says in his word and his plans for us. We can have these crazy doubts, and I can actually encourage you, like if you have those doubts, Yay! This is an opportunity. An opportunity to be pushed closer to God. Now we call this decision point right here, where our heart's affections hits the ramp and goes towards God, we call that faith. We call that intimacy. Right? So I just want, I just want to revisit this little page right here so that um, you can, one, have that in your brain, and then, two... It'll help you make sense of the rest of this story. And finally, 
I want to talk about what it means to inherit the riches of God. I've been doing this every single week too. It may seem a little unconnected to my sermons, but I assure you that it's not. See, we Christians look forward to a place called heaven. We look forward to when all things are made right again. We look forward to a day when we're able to live in whatever the perfect world is that, that God has coming. Right? And there's plenty of pictures in pop culture and all that sort of stuff. Maybe for some people, it's like floating around a, on a cloud, you know, playing a harp. For other people, it's like standing in the very presence of God, casting down their crowns. For other people, it's like living in a brand new earth and uh, in a brand new city where everything is just perfect where the streets are paved with gold. And God promises us that because Jesus came and died for us, because he has made a sacrifice, he has therefore adopted us as the children of God. And that if we're adopted, we have full legal right to the entire riches of God. What are the riches of God? Is it gold? Let me, we, have to get, we have to do this because some people actually believe it is. Is it gold? Is it riches? No. no, it's not. It's not riches. In fact, the Bible will tell us that riches mean so little in heaven that the street is paved with them. It's, it's, like, it's like concrete. It's, it's something you, you, you pour a slab out of is gold. And so, so maybe it's not money. We're not looking forward to money. What are we looking for? When we're adopted into the family, what do we get? What is the riches of the family. It is the family itself. Now this is good news. This is great news. But this is also horrible news. This is good news because it means that every, every child of God is your inheritance. That you have the right to grab me by the shirt front and say like, you are my family. You are my reward. God has promised that I get you out of this deal. Right? And then it's also really bad news because it means that we're other people's riches. And sometimes that's not good because we don't know how to deal with sin. And so we say things wrong. We do things wrong. We treat people poorly. So this is both a challenge and an encouragement. And here's the greatest thing about adoption. When you're adopted into God's family, it, it doesn't go away. Just because you say something mean to your brother or sister, or to your mom and dad, doesn't mean you're not adopted anymore. It means, now here's where our whole sermon is going to rest this morning, right? You have to get this. It means that screwing up, us screwing up and hurting each other is part of of the deal of salvation. Wait, wait, wait. You're telling me that heaven, that, that, that all the riches of God, everything he has to offer us, he has put me on sort of a plate. And he's saying, do you want the riches of God? Let me introduce you to Pat Carbaugh. Let me introduce you to Bruce and Billy, to Geraldine, to Susan, to John. Let me introduce you to Graham and Carmen. And this is the riches of God. That's a challenge, right? Because sometimes we don't act like the riches of God. So, this is where we're going to end up this morning. After I do all my preaching, this is where we're going to end up, right? Sin is really difficult, and God is in it for the long haul. That's what this story is about. This part of the story is about God changing the rules so that people and God can be in it for the long haul. Let's begin. Chapter 8. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. That's as far as we're going to get. I have to, I have to paint this image for you. In the prelude to the flood, we saw all of the light on the earth sort of being snuffed out one by one. 
The devil getting his way, putting that wedge in here and putting that wedge in there. And all of creation, all of creation being divorced from God. Violence filling the earth. Not peace, violence. Sin, darkness. And, and by the time we get to the story right before the flood, it says that God repented that he made man. He was so sorry. He was ready to turn completely away. That he had made man and beast and the, the whole thing. He was sorry about all of it. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. So I gave you the picture of sort of this, this one little candle. And the whole earth... There's just one little candle, and it's about to get snuffed out. And I told you the end of that sermon, watch. Because sin's accusation is that, Satan's accusation is that God's soft on sin. He can't deal with it. He can't help himself. That sin is more powerful. It's more infectious than salvation. But see, sin forgets that God is sovereign. That God owns all the rules. And we'll see this sort of time and time again. When God gets into a serious fight, when he's really, really, really going to just, going to just decimate the opposition, he actually won't fight them. Because he owns everything. It's sort of more like God stepping back from, from the, the carpet that they're standing on while sin's all spoiling for a fight, and he'll just grab the carpet and yank it out. And sin will fall over and stab itself in the heart sort of a thing. Right? I said, I said, watch, because what we see here, what I see here, is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lion of Judah, who is prowling around the edge of that flame. And he's saying, this flame won't go out. Now, when we read this verse... But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. When we read that, we have now gotten to a point in the story where the Lion of Judah, where the King of Kings, where the, where the Lord of Lords, this, this omnipotent being, has gone to war. And he has sort of lost himself in it. Here's the visual image that I get. There is a man with his family... And this is actually going to sound like a lot of Harrison Ford movies, okay? That's, that's fine. There's a man with his family, okay? And, and something happens in the middle of the night where there's a bunch of bad guys who start sneaking in and sneaking around. And before you know it, there's no hope for the family, right? All the bad guys are coming in and they're really bad. And the hero of the story goes, like, turns to his wife and he says, baby, take the kids and go hide up in the panic room, right? Go up into the bathroom and close the door, lock it, don't you open it for anybody, nobody but me. And then they run up the stairs, the wife and the kids, and the main character sort of turns and faces, you know, all the bad guys and he sort of cracks his knuckles, right? And he's like, it's on. And, and all of a sudden, the movie gets really exciting as you watch the main character going through and cleaning house. Usually he's got like two pistols or something, and he's just going around, just decimating the bad guys. And they're like helpless. They didn't know that this dude was ex-commando, you know, ranger. They, they didn't even know. They thought he was just, you know, some, some dopey, some what? Salesman. Some dopey salesman. There you go. <laughs> That's what they thought. They thought that he was just a farmer. They thought that he was, they didn't know that he had this long history of, of being, you know, this gladiator or something. And they come in and they get the surprise of their life. And this dude at some point is going to be like, like kneeling at the foot of the stairs with two smoking guns, right? Both clips empty and just this mass of bodies laying around him, right? Every bad guy dead. That's where we're at here in this story. And all of a sudden, the character remembers. My wife and kids are upstairs. That's where we're at here in the story. God remembers Noah. Now, here's the amazing thing. When God battles sin, this is what he does. We see that in creation, in the first day of creation, when it goes all the way through, um, that God makes our world work by stepping into it, by breathing into it, by speaking into it, and by physically making things. 
things. And um, our, our forefathers, uh, actually the, the founders of this nation, will take this idea and they'll, they'll put a big capital P out there and they'll call it providence. And that's the theological word that they will use for the whole world continuing to exist and run as it does because God's a part of it. And, um, and, and you'll actually, um, kind of gives me chills to think about it, but um, the framers of our constitution, of our country, they believed that because God was in our world, that the creation of our nation was justified. But they believed, they called on providence. They said, we call on providence. We make an appeal to heaven. Because they believed that God was in creation running the whole thing. And what we see in the flood is, and this is where my previous example was, was a little bit off theologically, God actually doesn't go down and duke it out with sin. God starts removing himself from creation. And we see the whole thing collapsing in on itself. And it's as if God is saying to Satan, saying to sin, all right, tell you what, when I'm not around, you handle business. You say I'm soft on sin, that you're stronger than me. It turns out you're a parasite. All I have to do is step back. And you can't even handle the elements. You can't even make the ocean do what it's supposed to do. You can't make the clouds do what they're supposed to do. All I have to do is take one little step back and you will be destroyed because you are not the king. I'm the king. And God remembers Noah. And Noah, through his righteousness, through his faithfulness, he was able to be saved because he and all these livestock and all his cattle and stuff floating around on the surface of all of this destruction. In a way, this is going to be a little mind-bending, when God steps back and he pulls himself out and all of nature just sort of starts collapsing in on itself, we see this raw, unbidden power of the Holy Spirit, sort of uninvited by sin, unrestrained by God, and it just comes and smashes the everything totally. Try not to say a descriptive word here from the pulpit. <laughs> <clears throat> and this is like the glory of God. His power. Like all of creation is just singing about how awesome he is. It's being totally unleashed. It doesn't have to obey by his rules anymore. It just sort of gets to have this big brawl. The land and the water and the wind. And Noah's floating around on the surface of this. See, his obedience, his faithfulness, allowed him to just buoy on the top of the water. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. This word wind is the same word uh, that we see in Genesis chapter 1, where it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That word spirit is the exact same word as this word wind here. Right? It's also the same word when Adam and Eve are walking in the cool of the day. It's the same word. Wind, spirit, cool, whatever, whatever you... However the, the Bible will translate different ways. But there's supposed to be this kind of um, allegorical gift that the narrator's giving to us. He, when God is going to bring everything back under control, what does he do? He blows his spirit. And it says that the waters subsided. They literally like start quieting down. They weren't doing what they were supposed to. The spirit of God comes back in and says, time out, I'm back. Let's go back to where we're supposed to go. Go back to the limits that I created for you. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. The waters receded from the earth continually. And at the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month, 
in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made, sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him in the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. Let's pause there a second. There is a reason that the author, or the narrator here, is spending so much time talking about a dove and a raven. I'm going to be totally honest with you. I'm not really sure why. Um, I've done a ton of work on this. I would invite you into that work. I have no pat conclusions for you, but I know it's important. Here are a few things that I've discovered as you go on your journey, whether you want it or not, you know, to, to try to wrestle that this week. The raven is a very smart bird, and it's an unclean bird. The dove is a very gentle and stupid bird, and it's a clean animal. In Leviticus, God forbids the people of Israel from eating or for sacrificing, specifically ravens, and he invites them to both eat and sacrifice doves. Furthermore, the next time a dove, an actual dove, is going to show up in sort of narrator fashion as part of a story, it's going to be at the baptism of Jesus Christ, and it's going to represent the Holy Spirit. So this is sort of like a little vision here. This is a little part of the story that's important. I haven't totally figured it out. Um, it doesn't really make sense to me, but I'll tell you this. The raven goes out, and he goes around, and he's flying around looking for a place. It says he goes back and forth, and back and forth, and he's looking for a place to land. And for some reason, this doesn't satisfy Noah. Um, and so he takes a dumber bird, and lets it go, and the dove goes out and like does a few rounds and comes back to her. Now, to him. Now, what's interesting here is that Noah is going to reach out his hand, and he's going to take the dove back in with him. And then he's going to let the dove fly forward again, and the dove's going to go around, apparently find a really good spot, right, and then pluck off an olive leaf and come on back. And rabbinic commentators are going to say it's because the dove is in love and didn't want to have safety in the new creation without the dove's mate. Sounds great to me. I'm not really sure. But uh, I just wanted to sort of cue you into a few of those things. You can, if you're real passionate about discovering things in the Bible and seeing what God has to say, I invite you to pick up where I left off. Can't dwell on that any longer this morning. Let's move on. Chapter 13. Excuse me, that's verse 13. <clears throat> in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by families from the ark. Now, you've noticed that I've highlighted here in red every time God speaks, because one of the crazy things about the flood story is that there's actually very little story. And there's these long speeches that God gives. And I made sense of that last week by saying, it seems like 
in the, if you step back from the story, and the whole story is basically God talking, um, we seem to have the same invitation that Noah had. What made Noah righteous was the fact that he was the only dude listening and obeying. Uh, it seems that the whole earth is judged not because God's not speaking to them. God's doing almost nothing in this story except for speaking, but it's on them. They weren't listening. They didn't want salvation. They rejected God. And so we have to pay careful attention to what God is saying. And what strikes me here is when he tells Noah to go out, he tells him to bring out all of his family, and he tells him to bring out all the animals. Go ahead. You can leave. I just find that interesting. I find it interesting because I'm wondering, was Noah tempted to walk out of the ark and close the door? <laughs> As we're talking about our riches in heaven being you and me, I think sometimes we face that temptation. And God tells us no. And God gives him the reason that they have to go out. Because all of the beasts and the birds and the animals, they need to start to swarm on the earth. In other words, these animals, these beasts, they got to start making babies. That's important to God. Now, that seems, that seems to give Noah some sort of pause for some reason. And as we looked, the earth was full of violence beforehand. And, and God judged not just man, but every living creature. It seemed that there was so much violence on the earth, it was such an inhospitable place for human life, that to have animals reproducing and swarming on the earth could possibly be a very bad thing for Noah and his family. Nevertheless, Noah does it. And in verse 20, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. So Noah's in this sort of place of limbo. They're not going to be on the ark anymore. No more ark protection. They're going out. And the animals are going to start swarming. And Noah builds an altar to God, and he sacrifices animals on it, and says that God smelled this pleasing aroma. Now, I want to just... You have to know that some dead... is probably doves... <laughs> I sure, hope it's not the same ones that Noah put out of the ark and took back in with him. Um, he's sacrificing on the ark. What's pleasing to God is not the burning flesh. What's pleasing to God is the fact that there's a righteous man who is rendering unto God his service of worship. Remember when I told you this morning we call this a worship service? And that our service is to minister to God. Noah here takes his rightful place as somebody who ministers to God. And it pleases the Lord. In fact, one of the, as we get to later on in the prophets, they're all going to start saying to the people of Israel, you think God is pleased by the smell of sacrifices alone? It's not the burning animals God wants to smell. It's obedience and faith and mercy. It's his people ministering to him. And you guys are doing it with a hard heart. You're doing it, you are putting sacrifices on the altar to Yahweh, and you're going out and you're serving other gods and you're doing other things. You're cheating people in the fields. You're, you're, you're not staying faithful to your wives. And God, that pisses God off. Uh, here we have the opposite, a righteous man who's serving God. And God, when he sort of smiles in his heart... What does he say? The first words out of his mouth. I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. 
Remember the garden story. What does God do for Adam? A lot of people will call, it, will call it the curse, Adam's curse, but in fact we see God wasn't cursing Adam. He was cursing the ground for Adam's sake. And we saw in the prelude to the, the flood that all of the righteous people had really, really, really hard lives. And Noah's father, Lamech, the other Lamech, the good Lamech, not the bad Lamech, says, this one, speaking of Noah, will bring us relief from the toil of our hands. Speaking directly about the curse. God changes, God here is going to change the way that he deals with people and sin. This is crazy, this is a big theological move. He's going to change this curse on the ground. Why? And this is actually kind of discouraging. He doesn't say, Noah finally got it, the problem with sin is over, the curse is gone, rich lives for everybody, not too much toil, Sin's over, baby. He says actually the, the opposite, doesn't he? It almost seems to me like God is a husband. And the husband and wife are dearly in love with one another. Uh, I know a, quite a few young married couples. And let me tell you, there comes this point in a married person's life where the honeymoon is over. Right? And, and what we're talking about is not, is not the feelings of love cease, but you, you realize that there's actual work that has to be done if the marriage is going to be meaningful at all. Right? There's actual work that's going to have to be done. And you're up till like three in the morning arguing about like God knows what. But it's really important because, because it turns out that one of the things that a, a lasting marriage has to have, must have, is the ability to handle conflict. The ability to handle conflict. You have to be able, with your spouse, or any good friend, really, any good friend, you cannot have a solid friendship in which two people cannot say, I hate it when you do that to me. Don't treat me that way. And when somebody turns to the other person and says, never again will I do that. I'm so sorry that I did that to you. I apologize. I, 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 we're in this for the long haul, right? We're in this for the long haul. Let's set up some ground rules, right? We'll never use swear words at each other. That's one of our ground rules. You know, we'll never hit each other. That's one of our, that should be one of your ground rules. <laughs> All right? Uh, the, people have to start laying down a foundation for their relationship if they're going to be in it for the long haul. Dating relationships that cannot get beyond that will not survive as marriage relationships. They can't. In fact, a lot of times, right, this is sort of like the, 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 told that it's time to break up with so-and-so, is when you go, you know what, that particular thing drives me nuts, but I'm not going to say anything about it. Why? You've already made up in your mind or in your heart, this relationship isn't going to last forever. Whatever, they could just do that and it'll annoy me, and, you know, three months from now, what, is it worth asking them to change and draw, doing all this hard work when we're not even going to be together in three months or five months or whatever it is? See, we have to beware of our human relationships and our relationships with God that are all based on, I just feel good when I'm around them. And that's all there is to our relationship. Those aren't real. They aren't real relationships. And God says, I will never again curse the ground on man. Um, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. God sort of accepts it. Now, this is not resignation. This is resolution. Once you see God's resolution, God says, I'm not going to make his life bitter and hard until he changes, because he ain't changing. So instead, I relent. Instead, I make his life easier. Neither again will I strike down every living creature as I have done. God says, and this whole flood judgment thing, I'm not going to do this anymore either. 
Let's go to uh, 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It's important to God that people have babies. It's important to him. That's his invitation to them. Have kids. Have lots of kids. Kids warm God's heart. Heath is doing his part. <laughs> but there's something that God doesn't say like, Hey, the problem of sin is long-lasting. So let's us work it out first. When we get it worked out, then maybe we can start raising kids, okay? God says, the problem with sin is long-lasting. I'm going to make your lives good and start having babies. Sort of interesting. Then he says, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So we're going to pause here just a second. All of a sudden, God says, you are going to be the scary thing. The animals are going to run away from you. This is a blessing. The animals are going to be your food. So it's sort of, as Noah is sort of hesitantly getting out of the ark, God says, have kids probably hesitantly going, oh no, like I'm not sure I want to do that. This world is a scary place with all these animals running around all over the place. And God says, no, I am reestablishing you at the top of the food chain. Now notice that when it was in the garden story, man was the top servant. He was the grower. He was the, he was the one who brought about, he led by serving. And here, God's sort of like, no, you're going to lead by being the scariest thing out there. This is a grace to us. Furthermore, he tells man that he's not to eat animals sort of savagely. They have to be dead. Don't eat them while they're trying to kick you. Right? And for some reason, the kind of savageness and the violence that filled the earth before, God is setting limits on how people can do that to animals. Then verse 5, And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning from every beast. I will require it and from man. So God says, if there's a bear on the loose, I will personally deal with it. That's a pretty good guarantee for Noah, I think. Now this is crazy because he says the same thing about man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. We see a second action that God had done before now reversed. Remember what God said to Cain? Cain the murderer? He said, people are going to kill me. God said, not so. I give you a mark. I give you this grace. He gave Cain a family. He gave Cain all kinds of opportunities. And God says in this new world, uh-uh, nope. Nope, that's not the way it's going to be. Because it smeared my image so bad. So, I'm actually going to end here this morning. I, I had planned to, to preach a bit more, but we're running out of time. Next week we'll finish up the flood story and then we'll move into Easter. I want to give an invitation here. God has made us in his image. He has changed the rules yet again. He has handled sin yet again. He invites us into this marriage relationship and he says, I'm setting up these rules because I'm in it for the long haul. I'm not resigned to sin winning. I'm resolute in being here for you. This is the same God who walks among us. Is crucified for us sheds his blood that we might be full heirs of the promise. And I see a God who is covenanting with his creation yet again. And I think of Jesus Christ, whose last words on earth was, Lo, I shall be with you to the end of the age. That Jesus is a representation, a perfect imprint. He, he has to be God himself because of the longevity and the resoluteness 
for which he loves human beings. I am going to give an invitation then for us to process through this that God is in a long-term relationship with you and that there are things that you need to clear the air with God. As a marriage partner, you need to have the opportunity to go to God with your grievances and to go to God with your expectations and to communicate. You can't have a healthy marriage without communication. And God wants that with you. 